a good morning or afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jan Reichert, Executive Director of the Antibody Society. Today's webinar is one in a series designed to inform and educate our members and the broader scientific community about topics relating to antibody discovery and development. Expert speaker, Dr. Ian Wilkinson, will discuss the importance of attenuating effector functions in antibody therapeutics. This process is typically referred to as FC silencing. Please note the webinar is being recorded. The presentation can be downloaded from the materials tab in the viewer. Please do add any and all questions to the Q&A box in the viewer, and those questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Without further ado, I'll now turn the show over to our speaker. Thank you very much, Janice. And also thank you to the Antibody Society for providing the opportunity today to talk about the recent work that we've been doing at MAPSOLV. So as Jan said, today I'm going to be talking about antibody effector function, the importance of silencing it when it's not required, and why some FC mutations are a better choice than others for achieving this. So as we all know, antibodies are nature's prodrugs. They've evolved to be the link between the innate and the adaptive immune system. And they do this through the FC domain, which engages with FC receptors or components of the complement pathway. And this leads to the activation of antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, ADCC, antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis, ADCP, or complement dependent cytotoxicity, CDC. And then through one or other of these mechanisms, this ultimately leads to the death of a target cell. And this is one of the things that makes antibodies incredibly potent biological drugs. Now, clearly in oncology, this is ideal uh, with the antibody acting as a beacon for the rest of the immune system. And in fact, there have been numerous efforts to try and enhance so-called antibody effector function, such as the use of a few costellated antibodies that lack the core fucose and thus have enhanced binding to FC gamma R3A and thus enhanced ADCC or more traditional FC mutations, typically in the upper CH2, which can be used to modulate FC receptor binding. However, in many situations, it's not necessary to engage with the immune system and the inflammatory response. And in fact, it may be highly undesirable. It may be that you just want to block the interaction of a ligand with its receptor, or maybe you want to recruit immune cells rather than kill them, as is the case with most bispecifics or maybe you're developing an antiviral therapy and you're concerned about antibody dependent enhancement. So in these situations where antibody effector function is not a primary mechanism of action of the antibody, it's uh, preferable to use uh, an effector null antibody, often termed an FC silent antibody. Now, naturally in humans, IgG2 and 4 have a lower effector function than an equivalent IgG1, and also there have been groups that have been working on mutated versions of IgG1 to try and lower the effector function. Typically this work has focused on two leucines, 234 and 235, which form a hydrophobic patch at the upper CH2, which interacts with FC receptors. And so by introducing mutations at these sites, you can greatly disrupt binding of the FC receptor to the FC domain. Alternatively, People have uh, focused on um, asparagine 297, which is aglycosylated, and uh, the glycans typically interact with the FC receptors. By removing the glycans, so by introducing a mutation at asparagine 297, creating a so-called aglycosylated antibody, then you can significantly reduce binding of the FC to FC receptors. So the variants that are listed here at the bottom are the ones that are most typically utilized in the, uh, in the clinic, but this is primarily because these are all IP free. It is widely acknowledged that none of these are truly silent. And this was most catastrophically demonstrated with a clinical trial held in the UK in 2006 with the anti-CD28 antibody TGN 1412. This was given to six patients and within minutes of receiving the antibody, they all showed severe signs of cytokine release syndrome, and this led to multiple organ failure. In fact, these six patients were incredibly fortunate to survive this incident. Now, this is an incredibly complex case 
with numerous contributing factors, but one of them is the fact that this was a human IgG4 antibody. It was thought to be silent enough not to lead to cytokine storm, but it turns out that human IgG4 still has substantial residual binding to FC gamma R2 in this case. That's found on the surface of B cells that led to uh, hypercross-linking and activation. And even if you consider TGM1412 to be an extremely rare example, there's still many other examples of supposedly silent antibodies that lead to mild to moderate cytokine release in the clinic. Now, the founders and advisors at Mabsolve have probably taken upwards of 20 antibodies into the clinic, and some of these have been silenced by various mechanisms, including aid-like oscillation, LALA, and IgG4. And with all of these, they've observed cytokine release in patients in the clinic that has led to dose-limiting toxicity. Perhaps the most interesting paper that I'm showing here is the one on the right-hand side from Isaacs. This is perhaps the only clinical comparison of IgG1 and IgG4 variants of the same antibody. In this case, the antibody is uh, Campath, and the authors noted with great surprise that even the IgG4 variant led to target cell depletion and cytokine release. Admittedly, this was lower than the IgG1, but still quite substantial. And note that this is 1996. This is 10 years before the TGN1412 disaster. Yet the early warning signs from this publication and others didn't seem to get picked up by the wider community. And perhaps more worrying than that is the fact that, to a large extent, we still don't seem to be learning the lessons about the potential risk of IgG4 and insufficient silencing. So what we've been trying to do internally at Mabsolve is an analysis of all the FC variants that have been utilized in the clinic. This is actually much more challenging than you might imagine. We've trawled through all of the antibody databases that are openly available. Um, they often provide minimal information about the FC. If they do provide a sequence, often it's just the variable domain and not the constant domains. About the closest we've managed to get to is uh, two downloadable spreadsheets from the Antibody Society, one which is for approved antibodies and the other which is for antibodies in late stage trials. And in both of these, they provide some information about uh, the FC domain and what mutations it may incorporate, whether it enhances or reduces effective function. But they don't provide full sequences. This makes it impossible to verify, and it doesn't incorporate antibodies in earlier stages of trials. So what we've been doing is going to the World Health Organization's lists of international non-proprietary names, INNs. Uh, these are published a couple of times a year, and in that they have a whole load of information, including the full sequence of the antibody. So we've been laboriously extracting these sequences from all of these PDFs and then trying to analyze those. So at the moment, I have a list of about 880 INNs. This covers all antibodies, uh, fragments, and FC fusions. I've got full sequences for about 800 of the 880. And then this data set that I'm showing here is analysis of those sequences for 300 of them so far. I should say we do intend to publish uh, this data once it's uh, complete and make it available for the wider community. So on the left-hand side is a pie chart showing analysis of all of these 300 antibodies that I've analyzed so far. As you would expect, the vast majority are IgG1s with the rest being IgG2 or 4. On the right-hand side, I've then extracted those antibodies that are silenced. So this is either naturally silent or with mutations to reduce effective function. And this is 31% of all antibodies that have been used in the clinic uh, utilize some form of silencing. And given what I've just said about TGN1412, what was really surprising to me when I first pulled out these numbers is that almost half the antibodies, 45%, still utilize wild type or hinge stabilized IgG4. And when I first saw this, I thought maybe that's just those antibodies that are in later stage trials or have already been approved. But it turns out that even in phase one and two, 38% of silenced antibodies are utilizing wild type or hinge stabilized IgG4. So again, we don't seem to be learning the lessons about, about the potential risk of IgG4, but I've also shown that others are also problematic. LALA, Aegli, and others also lead to cytokine release in the clinic. And in fact, it's not just cytokine release that's a potential challenge with these variants. Many of them are known to also have manufacturing risks. 
IgG2 and 4 both undergo disulfide scrambling in the hinge region. That makes manufacturing more challenging. IgG2, 4 and their glycosylated antibodies all have lower half-lives than an IgG1 equivalent. A glycosylated antibodies have significantly reduced thermal stability due to destabilization of the CH2 domain once the glycan is lacking. And IgG4 antibodies are more prone to aggregation than an IgG1 equivalent. Yet in spite of all of these challenges, these, the, uh, the, these inferior variants, if you will, still make up the vast majority of silent antibodies utilized in the clinic. Now, there have been a small number of groups that have been working on their own proprietary, mainly IgG1-based silent variants. But in my experience, the wider community didn't really start to acknowledge the potential risks and challenges of inefficient silencing until 2016. And in 2016, Roche published work on their novel silencing variant called Lala PG. And although other groups had reported novel silencing variants prior to this, this was probably the first time that a group had really taken a serious effort to compare their proprietary variant, not only to wild type IgG1, but also all the widely used IP3 options that were being utilized in the clinic at the time. So what I've done here is extract a little bit of data from that paper. They were utilizing a FRET assay to monitor uh, binding of IgG variants to FC receptors. The data is, is comparable really across all the FC receptors, but most clear on human FC gamma R1 because this is the highest affinity receptor. And so it gives you the most resolution and the ability to, to distinguish between any low level binding that the IgG variants may be showing. And in green across the top, what you see is LAL RPG. This essentially shows no binding to human FC gamma R1 or the other FC receptors. And then all of the other variants in this assay show some degree of binding to one or more of the FC receptors. So at the time that this publication came out, I was the chief scientific officer at Absolute Antibody. For those that don't know it, it's a CRO offering uh, antibody expression and engineering services. And on an almost weekly basis, I would have customers coming to me saying, can we make use of LAL RPG? Now, clearly there's a freedom to operate issue here. And so the next question they would ask is, well, please, can you recommend an alternative? Because Roche have clearly demonstrated that IgG4, LALA, and AGLI are insufficiently silenced, and I need something that behaves more like LALA PG. Now, unfortunately, we just didn't have a good answer for that. Roche had done a good job of analyzing most of the IP3 options, but they hadn't analyzed any of the other proprietary variants that are out there. And so we thought, well, maybe we should go about doing that. And maybe at the same time, we might be able to come up with our own FC silence solution that we might be able to offer to customers as an alternative. So as I said earlier, leucines 234 and 235 um, tend to be focused on for silencing, but it's also known that the next amino acid along, which is a glycine at 236, is also critical for binding to FC receptors. My background is as a structural biologist. So I basically sat in front of a computer for a number of hours and days, trying to understand the different variants that had been generated previously, work out why some might behave better than others, and see if I could develop my own novel constructs. In particular, focusing around these three amino acid positions. So we generated some initial proof of concept molecules, and it very quickly became apparent that really you had to incorporate an arginine at position 236 if you wanted really low levels of FC receptor binding. So that meant ideally what we needed to do is create a library of all possible mutations at 234 and 235 in combination with an arginine at 236. This leads to 361 theoretical combinations. Unfortunately, we just didn't have the R&D budget to make all of these. So instead, what we did is we went through an in silico triage process, removing uh, variants that we didn't feel were desirable. So we didn't want to incorporate free cysteines. We didn't want uh, deamidation sites, glycosylation sites. We didn't want to enhance immunogenicity, et cetera. And through this process, we got to 152 acceptable combinations. The other thing we were very keen to do is have a really sensitive assay for measuring uh, binding of IgGs to FC receptors. And as Roche had clearly demonstrated in their work, 
Human FC gamma R1 is the highest affinity receptor, and so it gives you the best resolution and ability to distinguish between any low level binding that you might get. So we decided to focus on that. And on top of that, we also selected surface plasmon resonance in the form of Biocore as our assay of choice. We felt that that was likely to be the most sensitive assay we could work with. So what I'm showing here is some of our early data, as you would expect, wild type IgG1 binds very well to FC gamma R1, LALA and AGLI are substantially reduced, but in line with what's been reported uh, elsewhere, they still show quite significant levels of residual binding. If I now zoom in and adjust the axes, you can see LALA and AGLI at the top and LALA PG in comparison. So in line with what Roche reported, this is greatly reduced compared to LALA and AGLI. But to, but to our great surprise, when we first saw this, uh, we could still detect a small amount of residual binding, even with LALA PG. So this maybe vindicates our choice of Biocore as our assay of choice. So of the 152 variants that we'd uh, designed in silico, we synthesized all of these and then expressed them at small scale in, uh, in plates. And then we screened the supernatant for binding to human FC gamma R1. And I'm showing the data in the graph at the bottom. Reassuringly, all of the variants showed lower levels of binding than LALA. And so we set a fairly arbitrary threshold and took 61 of these variants through to more detailed analysis. We then expressed those 61 antibodies at a larger scale, this time ran them through a full purification and QC process, and then again monitored binding to human FC gamma R1 in our biocore assay. And again, all of the variants showed lower level of binding than LALA, but to our surprise, almost all of them also showed lower levels of binding than LALA PG, and many of them were indistinguishable from baseline noise. So we then selected a further subset of these variants, took them through a whole battery of assays, looking at in vitro binding to FC receptors, uh, cell-based assays, thermal stability, et cetera. And from this, we selected a lead candidate that we call STR as our most optimal mutation for silencing. So all the data I'm going to show in the remainder of the slides is focused on STR in comparison to other variants that have been reported. And I'll walk you through how this leads us to the conclusion that STR is the most silent variant that has yet been reported. So as you would expect, we started with in vitro assays looking at FC receptor binding, C1Q and FCRN. And what set us out on this journey was this desire to compare um, proprietary variants that have been reported, ideally all of them, although that's somewhat challenging as there are many. So instead, we focused on proprietary variants that have been into the clinic and those that haven't been into the clinic but are widely cited. And so we came up with this panel here, and then we ran all of these through our Biocore assay uh, for binding to FC gamma R1. And what you can see is that all of them show some degree of residual binding. Some admittedly, like LAL RPG, are very low. Um, STR, though, in comparison, is zero. What's perhaps more important, though, are the IP3 options of LALA and AGLI, because that's what most people have access to if they aren't working at a company that has their own proprietary technology. And clearly those variants don't perform very well in this assay. It was though a surprise that the other proprietary variants performed quite poorly, uh, because if you go back to all the publications, they will make statements along the lines of uh, FC receptor binding has been completely abolished. Now, clearly that doesn't seem to be the case. So why is that? Now, it could be that we were utilizing a more sensitive assay. We were working with Biocore. Many people just utilize uh, ELISAs and similar. Or I think perhaps uh, more frequently, it's probably that most people focus on FC gamma R3A for screening, because that is the FC receptor that is important for ADCC. But as we've seen with the TGM1412 disaster, other FC receptors can lead to cytokine release. So it's our strong belief that if you're going to silence an antibody, then ideally you would silence it for all FC receptors, not just FC gamma R3A. Now, clearly what we needed to do is demonstrate that we'd not just abolish binding to FC gamma R1, but also all the other FC receptors. So that's what's shown here in comparison with LALA, AGLI and LALA PG. And what you can see is that the other variants show some degree of residual binding to all the FC receptors, 
STR is either zero or in the case of FC gamma R2, no higher than background noise. Now the data I'm showing here is for binding to human FC receptors, but we've also shown that you see uh, very similar results for binding to uh, FC receptors from other species. And in fact, you can transfer the STR mutations from a human antibody onto a mouse or a non-human primate antibody, and again, get total silencing. So you could utilize um, the STR variants in your uh, mouse or, or non-human primate models. Of course, we don't just want to abolish ADCC, but also CDC. So we've been looking at C1Q binding. And in all honesty, all the variants perform equally well in, in this, this regard. None of them really show any levels of binding to C1Q. The one thing you don't want to have an impact on is binding to FCRM because you need this to maintain your long half-life. So we've compared wild type IgG1 and SGR variants for binding to human, sino, and mouse FCRN. And as you can see here with the reported affinities, we've had no impact on the binding to FCRN. This really is in line with what you would expect from a structural analysis. The STR mutations are in the upper CH2, whereas FCRN binding is at the CH2, CH3 interface. But it's nice to confirm this with some data. We then moved away from in vitro assays onto cell-based assays in the hope of uh, being slightly more biologically relevant. And in particular, we worked with the Promega luminescence reporter assays to measure um, activation of various uh, FC receptors. So as you can see here, you really get substantial activation from some of these variants, which is very much in line with what we saw with the biocore. Anything that had a small hint of binding in the biocore tended to lead to quite substantial levels of activation in the cell-based reporter assays. This is certainly true for LALA, AGLI, FES, and FQQ variants. LALA PG is, is very low, and STR is zero across the board. Obviously, the aim of silencing ultimately is to prevent cytokine release in patients in the clinic. So we ran a cytokine release assay with PBMCs. And in this, we use LALA and AGLI as controls, and you can see they lead to quite significant levels of cytokine activation, which is in line with what I've said previously, that LALA and AGLI have both shown cytokine release in the clinic. STR, by comparison, gave no significant activation of any of the cytokines that we measured. So at this point, we really feel that we have something novel, something that is uh, totally silent or as close as, as you can get, and certainly more silent than anything that has been developed before. But clearly, when you're developing a biological drug, you not only need something that has the right function, you need something that can be manufactured at scale. So we've spent almost as much time looking at developability as we have done looking at functionality. So the first thing we've looked at is immunogenicity. We've done this both in silico and in vitro. I suspect many people in the audience, like myself, don't have a huge amount of faith in in silico predictions of immunogenicity, but it's pretty quick and cheap to do. So we did it anyway, and I'm showing that on the right hand side. So in this table, it's basically an assessment of peptides for their theoretical ability to bind to MHC class two antigens. And then these have been ranked relative to IgG1. Anything with a positive score is more immunogenic than IgG1. Anything with a negative score is theoretically less immunogenic. So on this basis, SGR is theoretically slightly less immunogenic than wild type IgG1. I would probably take that data with a pinch of salt though, and more important is the in vitro analysis, which we performed with uh, Proimmune in their T cell proliferation assay. And here we were working with wild type IgG1, LALA and STR variants, and none of them gave any significant proliferation above buffer allele. So from this really, we can conclude that SGR is no more image no more immunogenic than a wild type IgG1. We've looked at thermal stability and aggregation. We've done this for three different antibodies with three completely different sets of variable domains. And what you can see in the orange bars is that STR is always at least as stable, if not more stable than the wild type IgG1 in dark blue. You can also note on this slide, uh, the significant decrease in stability that you often see with egg like oscillated antibodies. We've done a forced degradation study. I'll admit that this is not a full CMC assessment. This is what I would call a research grade 
uh, assessments or antibodies are held at 40 degrees for two weeks at one mg per mil in PBS, and then we analyze uh, by SEC HPLC to monitor the formation of aggregates. And really all of the variants, to be honest, perform pretty equally in this respect. STR is maybe slightly more stable than wild type ITG1, but it's certainly not significant. And then earlier I said that we'd looked at in vitro binding of, uh, of the STR variant to um, FCRN and see no difference in affinities, but really we wanted to confirm this with a uh, PK study to make sure that we also saw no difference in PK in vivo. So we work with the Jackson Laboratories who have a variety of different strains of transgenic mice. We selected two of those strains of human FCRN mice, and we also worked with C57 black six mice. And across the board, really, we saw no significant difference in the PKs that we were getting for wild type STR or LALA variants. Thus again, confirming that we've had no impact on FCRN binding and the resulting PK. We've then looked at a range of other things that I'm not going to show any data for and, and just summarize very briefly. We've looked at antigen binding. We've had no impact there. That's really what you would expect for mutations in the FC domain. We've looked very carefully at expression titers for a range of different antibodies by transient expression in HEC and show cells, and we've seen no impact on expression titers. We also have a client of ours that's been working with CHO pools, and again, they see no impact on the expression titers with STR mutations. We've looked very carefully at glycosylation. We see no impact on N-linked glycosylation, whether the antibodies are made in HEC or CHO. And we've also looked for the presence of O-linked glycans because of the mutations that we're introducing, but we've not observed any O-linked glycans in any of the antibodies that we've made. These mutations are in the upper CH2 region that tends to be prone to proteolysis. So we were slightly concerned that we might have uh, impacted that. But if anything, it turns out that the STR variants are less sensitive to proteolysis by metalloproteases than a wild type IgG1. So we seem to have if anything, stabilized the FC slightly in that regard. And then finally, we've looked at combining the mutations with other very commonly used antibody mutations, such as knobs into holes, which is used for heterodimerization and the generation of bispecifics, and YTE, which is used for half-life extension. And in all cases, you're able to combine the mutations with the expected uh, outcome. So in summary, what I hope I've shown today is the need for silencing and importantly, the need for careful consideration how you actually go about achieving it. There's been many variants that have been reported, um, some of which have been in the clinic and some of, of which haven't. But what's clear is they are not all equal in their ability to totally abrogate effector function. What I've shown here, we believe is the most complete analysis of all the IP free and proprietary silent variants that have been reported. And we recently published this work in plus one for anyone that's interested in more detail. And in doing this work, we also discovered our own proprietary silence invariant STR, which we have demonstrated is more silent than anything that's previously been reported. Now, I don't want to turn this into a sales pitch, um, but I did want to take a short moment just to talk about how we are trying to make the technology accessible. So MAPSOLV is based entirely around this one technology. As I described in the introduction, the driver for looking into FC silencing in the first place was to discover something that was a better alternative than the commonly used IP3 options of LALA, AGLI, and ITG4, and then importantly, make it available to people. We are very keen to license the technology as far and as wide as possible, whether it be to large pharma, smaller biotechs, or academic groups. And we have a model to do so on what we believe to be very affordable terms. And then finally, for anybody that's attending PEX Boston next week, I'll be there myself. I have a poster on our technology and I'd be delighted to meet with anyone that wants to learn a little, little bit more about what we're doing, or by all means, feel free to reach out to me at the email address shown here. So with that, I'll thank you all for your attention and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions here. So I'm going to start with the first one. 
well, sort of the first one. There's a, a second first one. Uh, just um, the person asking points out that the question that they ask pertains to a like a glycosylated antibodies. With the question being, how significant in practice is the reduced thermostability of an IgG1 CH2 domain? My understanding of the literature is that the melting temperature of that domain goes from 63 degrees C to 60 degrees C, which is way below temperatures that the antibodies would encounter during manufacturing, fill finish, storage, and once injected into a patient. Okay, so typically I would ex expect to see a slightly larger reduction than that. So typically when we've look to air glycosylated antibodies, we see a reduction anywhere between five and 10 degrees. So you're likely taking your antibody from low to mid sixties into the low to mid fifties. I agree that's still reasonably stable and above the temperature that you're likely to, that, that like antibody is ever likely to get to. But um, if you speak to people in CMC, they tend to get slightly concerned when stability gets below maybe 55 degrees. So it's it's kind of starting to touch on, on those, whether that's a concern or not, I think depends on the parameters within each organization or CDMO that, that you're working with. But it's definitely destabilized compared to a wild type IgG1. Thank you very much. The next question had to do with the mutagenicity, but I believe it was asked before you got to that section of the presentation. So it was just a question about how you investigate the immunogenicity liabilities in silico. Um, but you did you did address that question already, didn't you? Yeah, so we, we analyzed that in silico and then again in, in in vitro. So we've looked at immunogenicity. I think ultimately anybody that knows anything about immunogenicity would admit that really you don't know until you get into the clinic. We've done the best that we can do um, until we get to that point in terms of analyzing with the assays available to us. Next question was sort of a question. The question is, can you please repeat the assay done to check the binding to FC receptors in cells? And that's certain <laughs> whether she oh, means so you to run to the lab those, and do that. <laughs> so, so those are commercially available kits that come from Promega, the luminescence based um, kits. Um, so you can buy those from Promega. They're very, very good to work with. And, and I think pretty much the gold standard in the industry for, for, for measuring those kinds of things. So another question has to do with how silent is silent enough. Uh, you remarked yourself that um, many of the proprietary mutation sets have been released with me with with these. So uh, I guess the the question is really how silent is silent enough? More is better. I'm guessing though. It's it's. Well, it's, it's, it's a good question and a fair question and, and one that I, I don't think we have a really clear answer to. So I will answer this by saying that there's clinical data demonstrating that IgG4, LALA and AGLI lead to cytokine release. So that would suggest that they are not silent enough. How much below that do you need to go? I don't know. There will be a threshold with, that once you're below that, you don't see cytokine release. And it's quite possible that LALA PG and some of the others that show very low levels of binding they're probably already good enough. But most people don't have access to those technologies. For most people, it's LALA, AGLI, or nothing. Um, and so we're trying to offer an alternative. And clearly, if you want to be silent, why not be as silent as, as possible? But where, where that line in the sand is, I don't think anyone has a clear answer. Next question is, what is the highest concentration you have taken the STR mutation to? I think we've probably taken it to 10 mg per mil. Uh, we might have some of our clients that have, have taken it higher than that. Our most advanced client is at stable cell line development, and they have run a PK study in monkeys. Um, so I suspect the antibody was at least 10 mg per mil there, possibly higher. What we've not done is, is taken it towards 50 mg per mil or, or, or higher. Next question, the attendee asks, I deglycosylate my, my antibody on the N297 conserved site to make antibody drug conjugates. In this case, am I able to abolish binding to all FC gamma receptors? So 
you won't totally abolish binding. Uh, a glyc oscillation certainly doesn't totally abolish binding. A glyc oscillation and D glyc oscillation are going to be the same in, in that respect. You will you will lower FC receptor binding, but not completely abolish it. Thanks very much. Uh, the next person has two questions. Are you saying that LALA PG do have residual FC binding? And question two is whether you have tried these STR mutations on mouse FC, in particular mouse IgG2A backbone. Yes, and yes, I think is the answer to, to those two questions. So, so yes, in, in our assay, LALRPG does have very low level binding. You know, I, I'm happy to admit LALRPG is, is a fantastic mutation. It is extremely low level, but we can detect it in our assay. And, um, and yes, we have put the STR mutations onto a mouse IgG2A. And again, you get complete silencing of, of mouse IgG2A with, with STR mutations. Next question, have you investigated abrogating, attenuating specific FC gamma receptors while leaving other FC gamma receptors and FCRN unaffected? Yeah, so, so FC receptors and FCRN, you can certainly disentangle that they bind at completely separate sites. And so you can impact one without impacting the other. FC receptors all bind at the same site. And so trying to disentangle those is, is almost impossible. You can slightly shift the ratio of binding of one to the other, but to get no binding to one FC receptor and, and total binding to the other is, is pretty much impossible. People have, have looked at this more for enhancement than, than um, silencing, um, but, but nobody has yet figured out a way to do it. And I, I don't think there is a way to do it because the, the epitopes are, are so overlapping, it'd be essentially impossible. Next question is, have you looked into the LALA GAAAA mutations? So every time I speak to somebody, um, they come up with another set of <laughs> mutations that we haven't looked at. So th this is the, the problem with, with anything in antibody engineering is, is there's so many variants out there and, and people generate their own variants on top of others that have been published and it, it becomes almost impossible. So, so that one, no, we haven't looked at. Um, like I said, we, we looked at all the ones that have been in the clinic and all of the other ones that have been widely cited. But there are others on top of that that we haven't looked at. We are continually getting these kinds of questions and every so often we'll make a new set of variants and add them to the panel that, that we've tested. That one was not on our list, but it probably will go on it. Okay, yeah, I, I imagine it's difficult to keep up. Next question is, besides in silico immunogenicity testing, have you tested in any T cell activation assays? So we've done T cell proliferation assays, so we've done in vitro analysis, yes. That question might have been before I showed the slide on it. I'm not sure. Next question, have you investigated whether or not the various silencing mutations, including SDR, affect receptor internalization? No, that, that we haven't looked at, no. The next question I can answer. Will this excellent presentation be available on demand? Yes, it will. <laughs> you will get the, a link to the on-demand version very soon, hopefully um, pretty much straight away tomorrow. Next question for the speaker. Uh, what about deleting the FC portion itself and formulating the candidates as antibody fragments like FABs? Well, I, I suppose arguably, if you want no effect of function, then the best way to do that is remove the FC entirely. Um, so a FAB is, is going to be the most you know, silent version of an antibody. But by removing the FC, you also remove the long half-life and you remove the ease with which purification can be achieved. You can't use protein A for purification. You have to use alternative methods. So the FC is, is incredibly useful, I think mostly for, for the PK. Um, but if you're wanting a short half-life and you're wanting effect to null, then, then FAB is great. But I think for most people, you really want the FC and then you need some means of, of silencing it. Next question, although I think myself, the answer is no. Have any antibodies with STR mutations actually entered clinical studies? No, it, it, we're too early for, for that. So we only 
developed this in the last few years. We started licensing it to people about 12 to 18 months ago. And at the moment, our most advanced licensee is at the stable cell line development stage. So it, it'll be a little while before it's in the clinic, but we hope it'll be in the clinic soon. Next question. Did you look into binding of immune complexes while, for example, D265A mutation highly reduces binding of in solution antibodies to FC gamma receptors. Immune complexes of the same antibody leads to significant binding. No, that, that we've we've not looked at. We we have looked at the D265A mutation, and I know that performs very poorly in, in our assays, so that really does show very substantial levels of, of residual binding, but we've we've not looked at immune complexes. Next question, with regard to heterodimeric antibodies, are SDR substitutions in both FCs required, or is one sufficient? That's, that's an interesting question. So we've always done it with STR in both arms, um, and I'm trying to think why you wouldn't do that. I can't really see any rationale why you would only put it into one arm. We've certainly not done that. And I don't know whether that would lead to total silencing or, or not. Okay, next question requires a little bit of a projection here. The, it's kind of a follow-on regarding whether the STR mutation has gotten into the clinic. The next question is, how soon do you think it will get into the clinic? Um, <laughs> I, I hope the next year or two, but it, it will depend <laughs> on, on, on our licensees. It's out of our control. <laughs> Next question, is there the any... the better. Yes, yes. <laughs> and we'll be tracking that, you can be sure. <laughs> is there any anti-HIV-1 envelope uh, MABs with STR mutations in preclinical trials, for example, in non-human primates? Uh, do you expect that they will suppress uh, viremia? Um, there, there aren't any that I'm aware of um in in preclinical trials um I, I don't think i know enough about that topic to really give a very good answer uh, unfortunately um so next question i'll take a stab at this and say no myself any therapeutics with lala pg mutation now marketed as far as i'm aware no um, but the, there's quite a few in the clinic. I know that for, for sure. So I, I imagine in, in a few years to come, there will be a few that are approved. And we'll be tracking those too. Next question, which may be the last one, unless somebody sneaks one in real quickly. This question is, since there are multiple bispecific, multi-specific formats and technologies, how efficient would STR be on those different platforms? Now, clearly there are probably hundreds of different ways of, of making bispecifics and we've not tested STR on, on all of those by any means. But as far as we've seen so far, the STR mutants, mutations seem to be universal. Whatever we put them onto, it gives total silencing. So we've not just done this with antibodies, we've done it with bispecifics, we've done it with FC fusions. Um, and on all occasions, we see total silencing. Um, so. My, my thought is it, is it should be agnostic to the technology and the, and the format, but clearly we don't have the data on, on all of those different designs. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to just uh, pause here for a split second to see if anybody sneaks in the last question, but we answered quite a few here. Thank you for going through all of those and uh, providing such an excellent presentation. Uh, so with that, I will um, add some concluding remarks first. I'd like to thank our speaker for relating his insights into modifying the FC region of antibodies to produce FC silent therapeutics. And I thank you very much for joining the webinar today. As I mentioned, an on-demand version will be available uh, hopefully tomorrow. I'll send a link to it via email to everyone who registered. Please feel free to watch this or any of our on-demand webinars when it's convenient. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day.